when I was, uh, I think, two and a half or three years old, and I was old enough to walk. I got into this storeroom which had all kinds of stuff stored in it, like TVs and rabbit ear antennas and whatnot, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't know what it was, but it piqued my interest. And then my dad had a shortwave radio that uh, I would play with when he wasn't home. And uh, the stuff coming out of it really grabbed my interest because I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to know more. And then what I didn't know is that my dad had uh, taken a uh, correspondence course from National Radio Institute of Electronics and I found all of his kit. And of course, kids take stuff apart, right? So I took everything apart. And uh, it ended up being disposable. Well, that was my interest. Uh, uh, it was the thing about the radio was uh, it, it represented. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, how to express it, but uh, to articulate it now is it's a connection to the universe. beam is composed of your uh, reflector element is out on the far end your longest element then you come in as your driven element and then the next elements are directors which direct your beam to the direction you want it to go down your boom and that's uh, the basics of uh, a beam antenna you have to have a reflector for gain and then your driven directors Okay, when Gerard comes and gets down off the tower, we're going to rig it so we can fly the antenna part way up. And what the reasoning is for that, we want to check the resonant frequency of the antenna to make sure that it's within the band at the lowest SWR reading we can get. So you may have, we may have to bring it up and down a few times, or it might be uh, right on frequency when we test it. And if it is, then we can uh, fly it up to the top of the tower and mount it. The lower your SWR, the better performance of your antenna. You want your beam to be pointing and directing the signal towards the station that you're trying to talk to. I'm not exactly 100% sure, but it goes back to when I was in high school. We had an amateur radio station at the high school and the uh, uh, shop teacher, my electrical teacher, uh, introduced me ham radio and got me in uh, an introductory uh, course. Uh, so that was quite a few years ago, about 50 years ago. I didn't get my uh, license right away. It was 
quite a few years before I got back into the hobby and got the uh, license, but uh, it was from that initial exposure back in the uh, like high school days. Uh, it was very valuable to me in that I learned all my basic uh, electrical and electronics, and I moved that off into my uh, uh, career as a power engineer and used uh, that knowledge quite extensively uh, during my working life. That's something that's quite common with a lot of uh, ham radio operators is that they, they've used that knowledge in uh, uh, their careers as well as uh, their hobby. I guess it's about the fraternity, uh, sharing knowledge uh, in a common interest, and everybody comes to the table with a different skill set and uh, all those different skill sets uh, combined to uh, a pretty high level technical team. Something that's worth a lot of money in the commercial world and most of us work in that field anyway. Do you still have that up in the air? No, it's down. Mm. It turned, it got turned into a four square for 80 meters. Oh. Because he couldn't keep it up in the air. The antenna, that is. <laughs> We're talking about antennas. This is going to be for the 40 meter band, uh, which uh, uh, the amateur section is uh, between 7 megahertz to 7.3 megahertz and of course it's all in the uh, for the purpose of radio contesting and uh, that's why we do what we do because it's it's an it's it's, uh, it's a chance to exercise our, our skills in designing things and uh, installing them proving that they work and then if uh, there's room for improvement we'll take it down and rework it. I use a computer to model all this stuff so it's we shouldn't have to take it down unless it gets broken by the weather. Plow winds like uh, really strong gusting winds, tornadoes, something like that. That'll uh, ice. Uh, ice. Icy yeah, on but, the but in this country we, it's it's this part of the world it's it's not too bad. It's not like on the uh, on the east coast where you get rhine ice on antennas and it collect like that thick and the whole thing fails. Cause it failed, the, the structure isn't strong enough to handle that kind of weight. But here, it's, it's like a desert, so it's pretty dry, so for the most part, the only thing that knocks antennas down is the constant vibration from, uh, from late wind. Not too much uh, an interest in uh, learning. Uh, we run an amateur radio uh, program. Um, right now it's taught at the college, uh, and uh, uh, we've got a, a basic program uh, and at the end of the program you write for uh, a license in amateur radio and then you're allowed to uh, start utilizing the uh, frequencies and uh, participate. You can participate in a lot of this uh, uh, stuff without the, uh, the license but you can't run, operate the radios by yourself until you have a, a license. You have to be under supervision. Some of us have spent a lot of money invested in the hobby, uh, but uh, it doesn't take that much uh, to get started to just do the, uh, uh, the bare essentials. Uh, you can get on to uh, our two meter repeater system and communicate uh, uh, with the area right from Camrose out past Maidstone the other direction up to Cold Lake and uh, uh, how far do we go down to Hannah? Hannah. Yeah, uh, we cover that whole area through the repeater systems and uh, uh, for, to get on and, and do that it's, it's only a couple hundred dollars investment in radio equipment. Uh, some of us I think we got a little bit more, uh, uh, my car is probably closer to five hundred dollars invested in the uh, radios and uh, antenna system. In the United States, there's about 750,000, uh, there's about 10 times the amateurs in the States as there is in Canada. 
there's quite a few in, in Japan. I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, it's another place where there's an awful high percentage of uh, amateur radio operators. And of course, there's quite a few in Europe. They're scattered all over the world. Uh, today, I was in contact with uh, Argentina, South America, uh, quite a bit. There's quite a few stations on from down in that direction. We have had uh, people reporting out of the Caribbean, uh, out of Florida, on the storms that have been uh, happening. So it, when there is no communication on the island, as long as we have battery power, we still can communicate and put up some kind of an antenna system. We can get out and talk to the rest of the world. It's, it's a way of, uh, of visiting other people, uh, making friends uh, over the, uh, you know, using the radio uh, in far-flung places that you would never have an opportunity to meet personally and there's no there's no uh, uh, substitute for the uh, the human voice the amateurs always play a pretty good role in that they can set up ad hoc in adverse conditions and they can get the word out uh, head in uh, without too much trouble so part of the challenge of uh, learning to be a good operator is knowing which frequency to pick, which equipment to pick, uh, how to match it with the antennas. Uh, to, do, to do the job that you want to do at hand. If we have a local disaster, uh, we've got uh, uh, very high frequency, ultra high frequency bands that we put to work, uh, moving information, whether it's by voice uh, or even electronically moving uh, uh, emails uh, between uh, command center and the uh, different emergency areas. Uh, if you have disasters like you have in the Caribbean right now uh, where the, they need help from outside, we would be using more of the uh, high frequency bands where you're getting longer distance uh, communication set up where you're uh, communicating in and out uh, uh, asking for help, asking for supplies, uh, giving out information of what's actually going on uh, within the disaster zone. So it depends on what you, uh, uh, you're trying to accomplish at the time. So over the years, uh, would you say you've made some friends all over the world as well? Yeah, nobody here, but all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs>